I find, you know, a lot of these people that have these negative views maybe have never even met a Jewish person and they haven't really read the scriptures through Jewish eyes. You are listening to Hebrew Voices with Nehemia Gordon. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's Makor Hebrew Foundation. Learn more at NehemiahsWall.com. Shalom, this is Nehemia Gordon, and welcome to Hebrew Voices. In this episode, I had the honor of sitting down and speaking with one of the truly great scholars of the Hebrew and Jewish context of the New Testament, Dr. Brad Young of Oral Roberts University. In this episode, we talk about how people who believe in Yeshua of Nazareth can start to learn to read the New Testament through Jewish eyes by healing the painful wounds between Christians and Jews. Be sure to visit NehemiahsWall.com for related links and further studies. Here is my conversation with Dr. Brad Young. Today, I'm in Afula, Israel with Professor Brad Young of Oral Roberts University, and he has come to Israel to teach here. And shalom, Professor Young. How are you? Very good. It's good to be with you today. So tell the audience a little bit about yourself. I know you're a Bible-believing Christian at Oral Roberts University. What are you doing here in Israel in, a, in Afula, of all places? Well, I was invited to be a guest uh, lecturer, teacher at the Galilee Center for Research into Judaism and Christianity. And what is your position at Oral Roberts University? Well, I'm a tenured professor of Judaic Christian Studies in the Graduate School of Theology and Ministry at ORU. That's located in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Okay, so you've come from Tulsa, Oklahoma to Afula. What are you teaching at, at the college here? I'm teaching a course on the Jewish environment of the New Testament. And there's interest here in Israel in that subject. Well, the center has brought together many students from around the world. The program at the uh, Galilee Center has a lot of students from abroad. We had a student from Hong Kong who's originally from Malaysia, which is unusual, wow. of course, for someone from Malaysia to come and study. We also have a student from Kerala, India. Wow. And we have some students from the United States. Uh, we have some students from Israel as well. Wow. Some from cool. Jerusalem that came in. So this is pretty incredible. You're here in Afula and you're teaching people from around the world about the Jewish, how did you describe it? The, Jew the Jewish environment. The Jewish the environment. Testament. Oh, it's awesome. Okay. And, and there's another section of this course that I'm not teaching, which really tremendous scholar, Dr. Phaedra Shapiro is teaching on Jewish Christian relations today. And one of the focuses of the center is how we can improve the relationship between believing Christians, Jewish people, bringing them together for education, research, academic exchange. Wow. It's really a tremendous program. Now, a week ago, I went to a lecture that you gave at the Bible Lands Museum in Jerusalem, and it was on this exact topic of Jewish-Christian relations. And I, and I have to say, Professor Young, one of the things that really surprised me in a good way was that you gave the lecture in Hebrew. And I don't think I've ever encountered an American Christian scholar who actually spoke Hebrew, didn't just study the ancient text, but could actually speak it. So I was very touched by that. That was pretty amazing. You know, I wrote a book that dealt with this interfaith dialogue. It wasn't the main topic, but it dealt with it, uh, called The Prayer to Our Father. Wonderful. And my father, who was an Orthodox rabbi of blessed memory, he read the book, and at the end of reading the book, his response was, he said, we have our thing and they have their thing. I mean, the Jews, we got our thing going on, the Christians. Leave it alone. Why talk to the Christians? <laughs> so what would you respond to my father? Why should Jews and Christians have dialogue? Well, you know, I, I really understand his feeling. I think Christian listeners and others should you know, try to appreciate the fact that Christians and Jews have been estranged from each other for 2,000 years almost, and Jewish people have felt, well, you know, we've been doing pretty well for 2,000 years without your help. Now, what's the deal? But I would say to your father, you know, the, the Christians today are very different from the Christians 
in the 1930s and the 1950s. So before you get to that, though, I think if you asked my father of blessed memory about this, he wouldn't say that we were doing well without you. He'd say the opposite. Every time we had dialogue, we were persecuted. The dialogue that we remember in, in Jewish culture was we were forced into these disputations to defend our faith. And the example that most at least many Jews are familiar with this, Nachmanides, who won the debate against Pablo Cristiani, and his reward is that he was exiled from his home country of Spain. And the dialogue you're talking about is completely different. You're not talking about debating who's right, the Jew or the Christian. You're talking about, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're talking about coming together on common ground. Am I right about that? That's right. Trying to understand each other, yeah. value each other. These disputations were horrible Absolutely. and uh, yeah. part of history and part of the persecution. And uh, what I meant by saying that is, you know, Jewish people have an identity. They've been able to struggle. They've been able to survive. They've been able to thrive. And it hasn't been because, you know, Christians have been helping them. It's been the actual opposite. They've been able to survive. Yeah. And look, I'll still meet Christians today. They'll say, look, you've got to be a Christian unless you can justify why you're not. Like, meaning their starting position is your existence as a Jew is not valid unless you can somehow justify it, which as a Jew makes no sense to me and is not the groundwork for having any kind of meaningful dialogue. I think that's the reason why we really need to come together. And to me, anti-Semitism with Christians is not a Jewish problem. It's a Christian problem. Wow. It's my problem. I need to deal with that. And so it's something that we who are leaders, educators, we're involved with our community. We're dealing with this day by day. And we need to focus on anti-Judaism and these negative attitudes and through education and trying to bring people together. I find, you know, a lot of these people that have these negative views maybe have never even met a Jewish person and they haven't really read the scriptures through Jewish eyes. So when we look at the New Testament in a Jewish environment, well, you know, how can we cut Jesus off from his people? Uh, there's a very famous seminary professor who would start his classes by saying, the first thing you've got to do to be a good Christian is to kill the Jew inside of you. What? <laughs> can you imagine? Wait, what, wait, wait back up. <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> he said, the first thing you must do to be a good Christian is to kill the Jew inside oh of you. Oh my, and you're not advocating that position you're, and at his all. Student, okay. Just to be clear. his <laughs> student raised her hand and said, do you mean Jesus? Oh. And of course, she had the greater wisdom. Oh. And I think this is our problem today. There wow. is this feeling of animosity. You know, everything good is in the new faith. Everything's bad is in the tree that nourishes the branch. Everything bad comes from Jewish faith and practice. And I think today we're trying to say, you have to value Jesus' family. You have to value Jewish faith and practice today as it is in order to understand your own faith. But to legitimize uh, Jewish faith and practice that every covenant We've got covenants in the promise to Abraham that are called a Brit Olam, which is an eternal covenant. Yeah. So Apostle Paul, as he was talking about his brothers and sisters who had not embraced faith in Jesus, I mean, he said, I would cut myself off for them. But then he says in the next sentence, these are Israelites. He never said they were Israelites. Uh, okay. So you're affirming the covenant that God made with the people of Israel. And in your speech, which again, you gave in Hebrew amazing last week, and I think probably most of the people in the audience were Jews, which is, again, also quite amazing. So you talked about how things have changed since the 1930s, and you just mentioned that before. So, so share for the audience who doesn't know, and certainly my Jewish audience has no idea, but I, I would bet even some of the people coming from the New Testament perspective, a lot of times people don't have an historical you know, view of how things have changed and progressed. Like they think the way things are right now is the way they've always been. So how have things changed since the 1930s in the Christian world towards the Jewish well, people? I think in the 1930s, even in America, where Jewish people have had a lot of acceptance and success, but people would look at the word Jew or Jewish in a very negative way. And today, especially when you go to evangelical Christian churches, you know, you talk about Israel, you talk about the Jewish people. I mean, this is very positive. 
And, you know, I go to some churches, they're singing Hebrew songs, they're waving Israeli flags, they're singing Hatikva. And these are regular mainstream Sunday churches you're talking about, right? Meaning These, these are, are the major churches in the community. Yeah. Wow. And some are what we would call independent, charismatic, they're uh, evangelical churches. One of the things I was trying to talk about in this speech was that there's quite a difference among the uh, Christians when we talk about evangelical Christians. Right. And some Jewish people today, and I think that's one reason why so many Israelis are interested in this talk, they see that there are a lot of supporters among evangelical Christians, and they don't quite know how to understand it. What are the reasons somebody might... I heard a, a very fine academic yesterday or the day before we were talking at the college, and he said, we've studied as Jews many years and done a lot of research about why you hate us. Now I'm trying to figure out why you love us. That's awesome. And I don't understand. So today we're trying to say, why do these Christians love us? Is this good or is it bad? You know, it's the famous joke that Jewish people always think are funny. Nobody else gets it. And probably all the Jewish people hear it. You have know, heard the joke about the teacher that asked the students to write a composition on the elephant. You know, so the, elephant. the French writes, the, the French student writes the composition about the mating habits of the elephant. Okay. And, <laughs> and the German student writes the composition about the aggressive tendencies and the protecting the territory of the elephant. Yeah. And so the Jewish student comes up, what's your composition about the elephant? Yeah. And the student says, is the elephant good for the Jews? <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> Who wouldn't find that funny? That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Look, as a small persecuted people, uh, you know, that, that is how we, that, that's, a, that's very apt. That's a, that's a very profound, because as a Jew, I take it for granted on every issue. How does this affect the Jews? And you're saying most people don't think that way in the world. That's interesting. That allows me to put my mind a little bit into the head of, um, you know, maybe a Christian who isn't thinking that, how is the elephant good for, for the Baptist church? <laughs> no, no. And, and, and I really think that's not far Christians would not quite grasp it. But Jewish people, they know instinctively what you're talking about. Is oh, this absolutely. good for the Jews? Is it a good thing that evangelicals are positive? And there's a sense, can we really trust them? Is there really a basis for okay. trust? So you said you encountered this this uh, Israeli academic who was, you know, saying we've studied why you hate us, and, and and I think that's so much easier for us to understand as Jews than why somebody would love us. So what is the answer? Why do you love us? Well, there's a, a lot of reasons. First, I'd like to say, you know, that these news reports sometimes we hear, oh, the evangelicals just want the battle of Armageddon and all the Jews will convert and all this. You know, I don't really think that explains it. In fact, this a, a recent book by Dr. Shapiro on Christian Zionism, which, you know, explored this, did some serious research on it. There's also some uh, studies by Zaev Haifetz that I think are, are helpful to this. But I would say it goes back to what's the right thing to do and how you understand the Bible. In this talk, I noted, I think not very many people realize it, but, you know, Harry Truman, President Truman was a Baptist from Missouri, from an evangelical background. And the State Department had said, don't vote for Israel in 1948. And that's what he was going to do. But he had a Jewish friend, Eddie uh, Jacobs. Let me give the people the background. Yeah. So the recognition of Israel as a sovereign state went before the United Nations, and the vote of the United States was very important in that recognition. And so Harry Truman has to make this decision, the State Department saying, don't support Israel. Yeah, I mean, the, everybody in the government in America says, vote no. Don't recognize Israel in the partition. Plan. Yeah, I, I, you know, well, maybe, you know, I think that's hard for a lot of American Jews, especially to comprehend, because we think of America as Israel's closest ally. But in 1948, it wasn't a given that America would back Israel. Well, you got to remember, we had received support from Saudi Arabia with oil. Right. And we kind of got that away from the British. The British really should have had Saudi Arabia as their allies. And you know, the State Department says, you know, there's no reason that this will help American interest. 
you should not support it. The only reason that Russia voted to recognize Israel, because Russia voted to recognize it, is it was the Cold War, and they were absolutely certain that America was going to vote against it. Really? <laughs> and so they wanted to vote exactly opposite of what America did. So why does Truman vote for Israel? I mean, that, that's a critical event that's in history. That's a critical thing. And I knew the daughter of Eddie Jacobson. She told her dad's story to to us several times, but uh, he was in business with Harry Truman and he prevailed upon him, please meet with Ezra Weitzman. And as a personal favor, he said, I will meet with him. I think and Ezra Weitzman minutes. was, for those who he don't know. He was the first president of Israel and he was a very strong advocate and a very educated, articulate. Uh, he was somebody that could speak about the biblical foundation and the connection between the Bible, the Jewish people, and Harry Truman's faith. And so, you know, when you think about a Baptist president, you know, maybe he's not real religious, uh -huh. but he went to Sunday school probably, and he, he had that orientation. When Ezra Weitzman came to talk to him, they talked for hours. And at the end, he was absolutely convinced, I've got to vote for Israel. When they asked him, why did you do this? He says, it's the right thing to do. Wow. Even though it might not have been so much in American's interest, it, no. was, it was the moral and right thing to do based on his evangelical Baptist upbringing and, and well, his, background. Historians might not say that, but I, I think because I am also, you know, grew up in the Baptist church and my grandfather was very active as a deacon and mm -hmm. he came to Israel in 1936, wow. which was unusual. But I remember him telling me how he traveled from Cairo to Damascus with a Jewish rabbi as wow. his companion. <laughs> and awesome. they talked a lot. But, you know, my grandfather saw Israel as Israel. He didn't see the church as replacing Israel. So that is a key thing I want That's to talk it. about. You brought this up in the speech. You're speaking in Hebrew. And, and, this, and, and I knew this because I've studied Christianity, but it struck me from the way you said it that when many Christians read in the Old Testament and what we call the Tanakh about Israel, they say, That's us, the church. And what you're saying is that when evangelicals read in the Bible about Israel, they say, That's Israel. Is that... Fair? I think that's a fair generalization, but I think you have to remember that in every denomination, every church, there are replacement theologians that read okay. themselves in there. And I think probably in every church and denomination, there's some that kind of get it right. But I think because evangelicals, let's say, you know, Baptist is one group in that group, because they take a more literal interpretation of the scriptures— and they're not just listening to the pastor or yeah. the priest interpret it to them. Yeah. You know, they read the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They see, you know, the literal children. Amazing. And yeah. they have to have somebody come along and tell them, no, no, that's not them. That's us. We replace them. So tell us what replacement theology is. I know my Jewish listeners have no idea. I suspect some of my Christian listeners have no idea either. What, what is replacement theology? Well, replacement theology goes back very early in Christianity. Sometimes it was fashioned in the question of the Verus Israel, who is the true Israel. True Israel. When you say very early, what century are we talking? Well, I think we see it very strong in the fourth century with John Christostom in Alexandria, where we had Jewish people and Christians praying together. But I really would trace it to the book of Romans because Paul warned in Romans 9, 10, and 11 that some of you are filled with arrogance, and you say, these branches were cut off, we've replaced you. And he warned against pride and arrogance, and he says, it's the root that nourishes you, and you're cutting yourself off of the tree you've been grafted in. You know wow. what happens when you cut off yourself from the branch you're sitting on? That's Dry a up, danger. Right? Yeah. Danger, you're going to hit the ground pretty fast. Okay. <laughs> but because I think already in at Rome, in this congregation that Paul actually didn't know very well, they were beginning with this teaching. Now, I think in the fourth century, it became very strong with this great leader that is highly esteemed in the church as a great preacher and teacher, but it bothered him that some Christians were praying in the synagogue with Jewish friends. So, okay, so hold on. So replacement theology is the idea basically that the Christians replace Israel in that eternal covenant that God had with Israel. Is that right? It's like I'm sitting in your place. Okay. I 
throw you out of your chair and I sit down and you have been rejected by God and your status, your privileges, your promises have been transferred. And so how they will justify this, they say the covenants are eternal and they're being maintained, but they're given to the new people of God, the true Israel. So the Jews are no longer God's people. Now the Christians are God's people. That's the idea of replacement theology, right? And the idea is that you are the Israel. The Christian is the Israel that is rich. So every time they read Israel or the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they say, well, that's us. Okay, gotcha. They're putting their name in and the And you're place. saying this goes back to the first century to Rome, and Paul comes out against it in the book of Romans. He comes out slugging. He's fighting wow. mad. He says the gifts and callings of God are without repentance in the old King James. And it means yeah. preach it. They Come cannot on. be revoked. Have they stumbled so as to fall into ruin? He says, Meganoite. May it never be. Heaven forbid it. Heaven won't let that happen. So Paul is preaching against this, uh, and what is that, around the year 40 or 50 he wrote that epistle? 56. 56. I, I love I it. love scholars of New Testament. We'll talk about, <laughs> you know, I don't know, the Book of Kings, you know, it'll be sometime in the 6th century BC or 50, and, and you'll go, 56. In 56, he writes this epistle to the Romans. Well, well, you know, it's, it's nice. We have a few yeah. things like an inscription and dates that we know and certain things that happened in the life and when Paul, you know, you get a little bit of a feel yeah. for it. So he writes this letter in 56, and as early as 56, there were people in the church in Rome who were saying, well, we're, we're Israel. It's no longer the Jews. And you're saying, now just jump forward to John Chrysostom in the fourth century. Is this after the Council of Nicaea, John Chrysostom? Oh, yes, yes. So it's after the Council of Nicaea, and there are Christians who are praying together with Jews in the synagogue? Is that what you're telling me in the fourth century? Yes. And this bothers him. Oh, yes. So how does he come out against this? Jews praying with Christians. Well, Christians praying it's with Jews. a vitriolic, uh, vicious attack. Don't, you know, be with the Jews. And, you know, some of the things that are very unfortunate. I mean, I think today in this uh, different relationship, I mean, I think it's wonderful when uh, I can take a group of students and I try to call ahead, talk to the rabbi. Is there a time that would be good, you know, and work with the schedule of the local synagogue? And the students love it. We often have a dinner with the rabbi. And this is from Oral Roberts University yes. you're talking about. Okay. So since I'm a professor of Judaic Christian studies and we value the Jewish roots of Christian faith, I can teach the ancient Judaism. I mean, I, I really studied from about 200 BC to 600 AD and try to have all those sources. But I always feel that Christians need to encounter Jewish people, believe their faith and live their faith today. So we do what we can wow. to maybe have an outside guest speaker come or go to the Jewish museum. Or We have a wonderful Holocaust museum in Tulsa, and it also incorporates archaeology. The whole museum is not dedicated to the Shoah, but that's an important part. Part of the museum. And uh, But we try to, you know, give those types of experiences. You know, some students, uh, we have a lot of international students, and some of our students have never met a Jewish individual. So when they get to go to the synagogue wow. and meet the rabbi, hear the Devar Torah word from the portion of the scriptures that are being read that week from the five books of Moses. That's a great blessing to them. And so there's a great enrichment for them to have that opportunity. But I think, you know, at the time of, uh, you know, here in Alexandria, I mean, isn't this wonderful? That's exactly what the book of Acts said. In wait, wait, so 15. Alexander, you're talking, we're now back in John now we're Chrysostom going back to, to the John fourth Chrysostom. century. So I want to understand the mind of one of those Christians who comes and prays in the synagogue that John Chrysostom was opposed to. What were these Christians like in the fourth century who were going to the Jewish synagogue, which enraged John Chrysostom? Well, our, our information is not complete, mm. and we would just... Okay, and they were coming on Shabbat, right? right? But I, I would say, if I would go back to the writings of the New Testament itself... When they had the Apostolic Council in the book of Acts, one of the... This is like Acts 15, Acts, Acts 21. 15, I mean, there was a great emphasis. We're going to ask those who are believing in Jesus from a non-Jewish background, they've got to do some basic ethical things. Basically, they're going to avoid idolatry and live a moral ethical life. But it, it says very clearly, and 
maybe they should learn more when they go to the synagogue. They'll hear Moses preach to every Shabbat, and they will learn all about it. It was almost assumed that all these people would want to study in the synagogue and to learn. I can see why in the fourth century there would be Christians if they just read the New Testament. Now, we don't know how many New Testaments there were, and of course, they didn't have bound Bibles. It's a lot different situation. All right, I want to look at this verse that you quoted from the book of Acts. You call this the apostolic council, which isn't a phrase. It appears to be okay. So they're asking the question, is it necessary to be certain? Here, it's Acts 15, 21. For in every city for generations past, Moses has had those who proclaim him, for he has been read aloud every Sabbath in the synagogues. And look, that's a tradition I grew up with, that you go to Shul, to the synagogue on Shabbat, and they read from the Torah. And in my synagogue, they read it throughout the course of a year in 54 sections. I was just in a synagogue recently in Ohio where they do the three-year cycle. So there's different ways of doing it, but they're reading the Torah every week. And you're saying, because I think a lot of Christians, correct me if I'm wrong, when they read this, they're saying, here are the things that the Gentile believer needs to do, and we don't need to worry about Moses. He's read in the synagogue. It's almost like they're dismissing the Torah because that's being read by the Jews in the synagogue. It, it, that's the impression I get from a lot of Christians I interact with. Well, I think they're absolutely wrong. I think uh, another reading that I'm, I see more and that we discuss is that, well, you know, for James, who's kind of reaching this compromise, he's retreating a little bit from his previous position that the non-Jews should be circumcised, keep the whole law of Moses. In other words, conversion to Judaism, complete conversion, would be required before someone could be welcomed into the fellowship of the early Christian movement to become a Christian. And what they decided after much debate is that, no, we will kind of give them a Another status, some would call it maybe one of the, uh, the uh, a summary of the laws for the children of Noah or, you know, kind of the universal moral ethical laws. Sometimes we see maybe even a different status for a ger toshav, a uh, resident alien. Usually the ger toshav has a higher requirement than what we see here. But if you would study in the ancient literature, what are the sins that led up to the flood, like in the book of Jubilees and even, you know, some texts of the rabbinic literature, well, you know, idolatry, murder, uh, and chastity, some types of sexual sins, all of this got so bad. Well, when there's a new covenant made with all of humanity, not just the children of Israel. I mean, when we go to the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, I mean, these are wonderful laws for all people of all time, but it was more of a covenant with the children of Israel, whereas the sons of Noah was universal. So it seems like in the synagogue, this was a theory that David Flusser, Shmuel Safrai, my teachers developed. They wrote a wonderful article about it in German and Later, it was published in English, and it's available online at the Jerusalem Perspectives hey, we'll, website. We'll put a link to that on the website. But, oh, it'll be a good good link to the Jerusalem Perspective. They have some wonderful articles there. But there they said, these are God-fearers. What and God-fearers was a status in Judaism at that time, which maybe isn't exactly mentioned in the Old Testament and Tanakh, but there was such a thing as people who in the Roman Empire said, look, I'm, I'm 60, I'm not getting circumcised, that'll kill me. What, <laughs> what, what can I do and still you know, show up in the synagogue and, and you know, not be treated like a foreigner? And that was the god fear status that you're talking about. Now, that's very interesting. So you're saying in the fourth century, these Christians in Alexandria are going to the synagogue because whether they read it in Acts or somebody remembered, they had this idea of you know, Moses. We, we has don't had have these. direct information, right. but it seems like that's But clearly, possible. you know, it says Moses has had those who, who proclaim him, for he has been read aloud every Sabbath in the synagogues. And they took that to mean, okay, let's go to the synagogue. And John Chrysostom hears this, and he's and he says, this, this is not good. So, so why was he opposed to that in the fourth century in, in Alexandria? Sometimes there's this sense of animosity toward the mother faith that's giving birth to this child. If you're going to be independent, you have to show that you're different. And this is something we study a lot in, as we look at the origins of Christianity. Where was a parting of the way? Some scholars look at it in 70 AD at the destruction of the temple, where a parting of the ways happened between the Jewish community, the Christian community. I kind of think it really was more intense later during the Second Revolt. I think we still see 
Christians and Jews associating with each other that Christianity was considered more of a Jewish sect. Now, when we come so to let's, this let's time stop there for a Christmas second. Time, so in 132 to 135, we had the Bar Kokhba revolt in Israel against the Romans. And you're saying up until then, Christians or people who believed in Jesus were simply a Jewish sect. They wouldn't have thought of themselves as a different, you know, as non-Jews. Is, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Why would they see themselves as another? The Talmud says there were 24 different groups leading up to Titus and Vespasian. Meaning in the late Second Temple and period, there are 24 Jewish Temple denominations and of course, or factions. You know, we've just finished commemorating Tisha B'Av here in Israel, such a important commemoration of the destruction of the first and second we temple think of yeah. the ninth the the ninth day of the month called av in hebrew of the jewish calendar when the first temple the second temple was destroyed probably you know even being traced back to the evil report of the spies who said we cannot take the land and so you know this is this horrific day and we think about how that was caused because of groundless hatred I mean, there's several reasons, but sinat chinam. And I think today we want to talk about unconditional love. How can we bring Christians and Jews back together? I, I say, Nehemia, sometimes yeah. it's like we're trying to remarry a divorced couple. Okay. Now, really, you know, I don't think Christians and Jews need to be married. I mean, Jews are going to be Jews. Christians are going to be Christians. But we should... Learn to love and esteem one another, learn from one another. And there's a lot of issues that we could partner together to help one another so that we could grow. Now, my own spiritual life as a believer, Bible-believing Christian, as one that came to Israel in 1972 and then continued studying and worked in this field, my life has been greatly enriched by learning from Jewish scholars, even those that didn't believe in Jesus. I remember one Christian friend one time asked me, what do you think you can learn from a Jew about Jesus? And I was thinking, you know absolutely nothing about Jesus because you you don't know anything about his faith, his family, his, Wait, his wow, heritage. Wow. So you said to the Christian, you know nothing about Jesus because you don't understand his Jewish context. Is that what you're saying? Right. So for a Christian to truly understand Jesus, he needs to understand the Jewish background in which, you know, that Jesus was part of. Yeah, you know, a very important statement was made by Pope Paul II in 1980. Yeah. He made this amazing statement. He said, whoever meets Jesus meets Judaism. Wow. And I would argue that Jesus brought ethical monotheism to the world through Jesus. And so as Christians come to faith in the Jewish Jesus, they have to see you don't cancel the faith of Jesus by faith in Jesus, but the faith in Jesus should lead you to honor and respect the faith of Jesus, wow. his family, his heritage. Which is the Jews. So this brings us to something you brought up in your talk in Jerusalem at the Bible yes, Lands Museum, yes. where you quoted uh, Reverend Jeremiah Wright, who had been Obama's pastor for 20 plus years. And you made the statement that According to him, Jesus wasn't a Jew, he was a Palestinian. And I had to go look this up, and it was actually even worse than what you said. Oh, it's a lot worse. It's, it's <laughs> unbelievable. He's giving a speech, and he's saying these Europeans, meaning the Jews, stole the land from the Palestinians, and this goes back to the time of the Book of Judges. I'm going to post this video or a link to the video on the website as well. People, you got to see this to believe it, what he's saying there. So basically, he's saying... Jesus was a Palestinian. These Jews are just Europeans who have stolen the Palestinian land going back 3,400 years. <laughs> like, wow. And you're talking about a very different perspective. Your, your Christianity is not the Christianity of Jeremiah Wright. In other words, you, you see Jesus as a Jew. And in order to truly understand your Jesus, you need to understand his, you know, have the faith in Jesus. I love that phrase. You need to understand the faith of Jesus, which isn't Palestinianism, it's Judaism, right? Is that... Oh, of course. I mean, this is an uh, indisputable fact of yeah. history. Right. But we have those that, doesn't that bother are kind Jeremiah of, right. <laughs> you know, let me say, Gordon, I, I'm, Nehemiah, I think I can say, uh, I'm for liberation theology, I'm for social justice theology, but the way we see liberation theology preached sometimes, like, well, the Jewish people are colonial power oppressing the Palestinians. How can you be a colonial power in your own land? That's impossible. Right. How can you occupy land that belongs to you? How can you, you know, Israel has done 
so much to try to make peace. And I think today, you know, they're really what we should be talking about is better education. There needs to be an understanding within the Palestinian Arab community of Jews and their background. And, and I think through education, we can build a better foundation for true and lasting peace and reconciliation. And I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, just on the local level, if you can get away from all the politicians, probably yeah. many Palestinian, Muslim, Arabs, and Israelis, you know, have some connections, maybe even like each other. And there is some things that separate us. But when you start preaching untruths, you say Jesus was a Palestinian and the Palestinians were here first in the book of Judges. And I mean, there, there's no way to connect that through the Bible or through any type of I guess history. he's trying to say the Palestinians are Canaanites and, and the Israelites came and took the, stole the land from the Canaanites. That's what he seems to be and saying. We hear this in some of the kind of propaganda that's being taught and now which is UNESCO. bizarre to me because the most common palestinian surname is al-masri the egyptian and there was a palestinian village up until 1967 or maybe 48 called colonia which was a roman colony of, of retired veterans who had destroyed the temple in 70 so for them to say they're the indigenous population is bizarre to me you made the statement that anti-semitic uh, i might be paraphrasing but so you'll correct me you said anti-semitic christian theology needs to be changed through education and research as a professor at oral Roberts University. Can you talk about well, that? Well, it's very alarming when we start looking at church history where there has been an animosity and sometimes anti-Semitic theology that's impacted our Bible translation, our theology, the teachings of the church. And so it's really wonderful where we see some changes. You know, when you look at the important decision made under the leadership of this tremendous leader, Pope John the Twenty Third, with Nostra Aetate in the Catholic Church in 1965, you know, over 50 years ago, basically said, you know, we can't accuse Jewish people of this time and all time of deicide of having killed Jesus. We have to affirm, you know, the biblical covenants. We've got to encourage interaction and study between Christians and Jews. And there's a lot of other facets of and that. And you're saying this is a wonderful teaching, even though you're not a Catholic. You're, as you described, a Bible-believing Christian. And, and by the way, in my book, A Prayer to Our Father, Keith Johnson and I, we talk about this Nostra Aetate as, as really a, an important step for Jews and Christians in having a dialogue. And, and, and I think I want to I wanna, I wanna just clarify here. So according to official Christian doctrine, whether you were Protestant or Catholic, before this you know, let's say back in the 1930s, Jews were officially cursed because they killed Jesus. And and what you said, it I love this in the speech, is that when, when the evangelical Christian today looks at the Jews, he sees them as a blessed people, which is a radical departure in 70 years, 80 years. Yeah, it's a total, complete transformation. I, I had an Orthodox Jewish rabbi friend say to me the other day that, you know, it's a miracle. It's It just couldn't be that in 60 years, the image and the understanding of a Jew has been completely changed within Christians. Now, I've got to be honest, I wish that was really the case. I think we've come a long way and we've got a long way to go. And I really, you know, admire what happened in that church. But you've got to remember, one thing I was trying to say is that the Catholics don't impact all Christian denominations. And, you know, when you have a hierarchy of an Episcopal leadership where the Pope of course, is in charge. Well, you know, you can have this council and, you know, the papal decree has a lot of influence. It still takes years and years for it to get into the churches and to the people. On the other hand, when we talk about evangelicals, where you have a different leadership, sometimes a congregational leadership, sometimes a very important pastor has a lot of power. In, in a way, really, what you've got are thousands and thousands of popes that you have to deal with instead of, you okay. know, one pope says something, well, a lot of the other priests are going to Meaning study. like each non-denominational church is basically its own denomination, and each maybe independent Baptist is, he calls... So, but the point here is that um, you're saying this isn't all Christians who have made this shift, but for many Christians, for the Christians who we may encounter as loving Israel, the explanation for that is they're no longer looking at Israel as cursed, but as blessed. And that's, that's I think, now the basis for some really great cooperation and dialogue. Because if, you know, you come to us and say, you're cursed, you shouldn't exist, you know, let's... Uh, and it's interesting. I've studied in history where, like, I think it was who they call St. Augustine, and he talks about Jewish service, which 
could be understood as Jewish servitude. And he's trying to justify in the Roman Empire, why don't we wipe out the Jews? We have the physical power to do it. And he comes up with this doctrine, no, the Jews serve a purpose. And the purpose at that time was, we, we want to go to the pagans and say, Jesus fulfilled all these ancient prophecies. Well, the pagans will say, show us these prophecies. Well, the Jews are living proof that the prophecies are true, meaning they preserved those books. And, and the pagans at the time, they respected the Jews as preserving ancient books. They were known for that, ancient prophecies. But that Jewish service devolved in Europe into Jewish servitude, slavery. Basically, the purpose of the Jew was to serve the local monarch or, or prince as his personal property, virtually. You know, And now we're getting to the point where the Jews are no longer cursed with this servitude. Now Christians, many Christians, are looking at Jews as blessed. And, and for me, it was a blessing to have a chance to sit down with you. We didn't even get to talk about, Professor Young, about your book, which I'm holding here, which is called Jesus, the Jewish Theologian. Guys, this is an amazing book. I read this years ago, and I reread it earlier this week. And it's really a powerful part of a series of studies you've done as a continuation of what uh, Professor David Flusser of the Hebrew University did. You were his disciple. I'm hoping we can get together again and have a continuation of this discussion and actually talk about Jesus, the Jewish theologian, and some of the discoveries you made and that Professor Flusser made. Would you come back and speak with us again? Oh, I'd be delighted. Wonderful. Now, I got to tell the people, we were sitting here in the place where you're staying in Afula, and as I was setting up the microphone, you spontaneously started to recite the Lord's Prayer in Hebrew. Would you please end with prayer by praying this prayer, the Our Father prayer that, that Yeshua of Nazareth taught to the Jewish multitudes, not far from here? Yes, I think many would know the words. Beautiful in Hebrew. Avinu Shabashamayim, Yitkadesh Shemcha, Tamlich Malchutcha. You have been listening to Hebrew Voices with Nehemia Gordon. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's Makor Hebrew Foundation. Learn more at nehemiaswall.com.